WTCC slash WTCR is coming to an end. Sure, it'll be continued in a slightly different way next year, but in essence, the format that this series has had over the past 18 years is no more. So in this video, I'll be taking a trip down memory lane to the dawn of this series and the rather interesting history that this category has had. The World Touring Car Championship returns to the track in 2005, 18 years after the series initially began in 1987. Although that era of World Touring Cars has very little similarities to the reborn one brought back by Eurosport events. The cars would be exactly the same as the ones used in the previous year's European Touring Car Championships. They include Super 2000, Diesel 2000, back when Diesel was seen as the next big thing, and Super Production Cars. A wide range of cars were utilised for the championship, including manufacturer efforts from BMW, Alfa Romeo, Ford, Chevrolet and Seat. In fact, in Seat's case, they updated their car midway through the season, from the Toledo to the Leon. The rules stipulated though that once you had changed your car, you can't go back to the previous car model that you'd run before. So long as you were a man. I mean, I can only imagine that's the case, considering the rule for that stated in the 2005 sporting regulations, in case a manufacturer homologates an extension on the homologation form, or a new car, different homologation form, a competitor can start using it at any event during the season. However, he cannot revert back for the rest of the season to the previous one. So seemingly, if you were female, then you would be able to go back to your previous car, if you didn't like the new or updated one for some reason. The championship restarted, ironically enough, where the first ever round of the World Touring Car Championship took place in 1987. Monza. However, despite being a world championship, the calendar deviated out of Europe only twice out of the 10 round schedule, Mexico and Macau being the exceptions. It was a titanic battle between BMW and Alfa Romeo that dominated the championship, with three drivers in with a shout of winning the title as the circus headed over to the motorised lottery that is Macau. Those drivers being Dirk Muller on 86, Andy Prio on 85, and Fabrizio Giovinardi on 81. The fortune though fell in favour of Prio, claiming two second places, whilst his championship protagonists scored nothing over both races. Prio clinched the title in 2006 also, by one solitary point over Jörg Muller. And in 2007, Prio did the job once again, this time over Ivan Muller. 2007 also marked the end of the Super Production category in the WTCC, with the Super and Diesel 2000 categories still going strong. Another six years of Super 2000 regulations passed by, with periods of manufacturer dominance by Seat and subsequently Chevrolet. However, new regulations were introduced in 2014 that were said to increase the pace by roughly 5 seconds per lap on any circuit. These machines had bigger 18-inch wheels, an aerodynamic specification that gave the car a more aggressive and outlandish appearance, as well as an increase in the power. What would these cars be called? Super 2000. Well, okay then. They were given new classifications, known as TC1 cars, which referred to cars competing to the new regulations for the season, whilst TC2 were cars from the previous sporting regulations. Unfortunately, whilst the performance of the cars had improved from a speed perspective, the quality of the racing had taken a bit of a downgrade. A new manufacturer had joined the touring car fray with Citroën. To put it mildly, the French brand absolutely kicked the buttocks off of the opposition. In just the four seasons it competed in, the manufacturer won 57 out of 90 races, therefore having a win percentage of 63%. What's even more impressive was that they were having to deal with the extra ballast that came with the wins, and yet they still won, and even further than that, won comfortably. Now, whilst it's right that we applaud the exceptional achievements of the Citroen team with its fantastic C Elise model, along with the equally amazing Jose Maria Lopez winning three consecutive driver's titles, it's important to remember that domination is not exactly the first thing that comes to mind when you talk about touring car racing. Sure you want the cream of the crop to rise to the top, 
but equally not rise so high that other cars running to the same specification are rendered nigh on obsolete. British Touring Car Racing is a great example of how you can make a championship that has a great number of cars and manufacturers whilst at the same time keeping all of them within a narrow performance window. It's also a good reason why, sadly, the amazing speed of the Citroens and the incredible talent of Jose Maria Lopez is a largely forgotten achievement by motorsport fans, unless you were a die-hard WTCC watcher. One thing though that wasn't forgotten from this era of WTCC was an event at this place. Surely, a round at the Nordschleife has to be one of the best decisions by the FIA and Championship Promoter Eurosport events. An event around the most daunting piece of tarmac on planet Earth. Drivers tested to the very edge, cars pushed to the ragged edge, and one mistake puts you to the edge of no return, as well as an uncomfortable conversation with your mechanics. It was a refreshing choice as well. It felt like the organisers of the series thought, why not? Let's give it a crack and see how it goes. No wonder it was generally the most looked forward to event on the calendar, especially considering that the iconic streets of Macau was now off the schedule. It was also around this time that a few new interesting rules were added to liven up the product. A joker lap was introduced in Portugal at the Villa Real Street Circuit, a first in circuit racing. However, one of the most interesting ones for me was a specific type of qualifying session where championship points would be awarded. It was called Mach 3, and whilst that may sound like the name of a button on a jet fighter that you'd rather not press, it was an acronym for Manufacturers Against the Clock. Just without the three in it. Eligible to any manufacturers, so long as they had at least three cars, the three cars need to set as quick a time as possible over two laps. The cars needed to finish within 15 seconds of one another, and the total time will stop once the third car crosses the finish line. It certainly had an impact, particularly in Slovakia in 2016, when both Honda and Citroen set an identical time. The winners? Both of them, as it turns out. Whilst this is all well and good though, an elephant was in the room. It formed in the immersion of a brand new international touring car series. T. C. R. Now I won't go into the finer details of that because I plan on doing a video on the success of TCR as a whole. However, with TCR emerging more and more, and also the manufacturer interest in the WTCC getting less and less prevalent, a deal was agreed between the FIA, Eurosport Events and World Sporting Consulting to use the TCR regulations to form the WTCC albeit with a small name change to WTCR. A cap of 26 cars per round was introduced, along with the requirement that a full season team must have two full season entries. The field consisted of your usual touring car superstars from Gabrielli Tarquini, Gordon Shedden and Ivan Muller, to members of the Dutch royal family. It was a thrilling title battle as well between Muller and Tarquini, with Tarquini coming out victor by three points over Muller. That being said though, this was as good as it got for the series, because as the years went on, the car count got smaller and smaller, with the pandemic and the continued logistical challenges in Asia, meaning that the series was starting to struggle. However, the straw that broke the camel's back was in 2022. Tire issues would turn out to be a massive hurdle that plagued the series. It led to the cancellation of the popular Nordschleife around mid-weekend, and it also led to the dominant team on the grid, as well as one of the big backers of WTCR, Lincoln Co, to withdraw from the series after Italy. This then cut the field to just 12 entries. With no hope of an influx of new teams on the way, the decision was made to end WTCR and turn it into a TCR World Tour, which will happen next year. But the crux of the matter are that world touring car racing as we've known it for the past 18 years is over. The thing is though, what is this series' legacy? How will it be remembered? Unfortunately, it feels like this series hasn't been remembered by many people. The races were, largely, unmemorable. Touring car racing has never been a form of racing that's been about outright speed. 
they are by far and away not the fastest racing category in the world. They aren't slow, but certainly when you look at it from a television, there are more invigorating forms of racing to watch from an out and out speed perspective. Where touring cars does have the trump card though, is in the bumper to bumper, door handle to door handle, contact infused style of racing. However, this series never really seemed to deliver consistently enjoyable racing of that kind. We had moments, but it wasn't the same level of, say, British touring cars. And when the main element of touring car racing isn't delivering quite as much as it should, it doesn't deliver a spectacle that leaves your buttocks on the verge of the sofa. That's not to say that this series didn't have its bright moments, but due to how seemingly forgetful it was, it means that its legacy on the racing world is somewhat hard to establish. That though is going to be it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. What are your thoughts on WTCR and in turn are you looking forward to the direction the series is now heading? Say your thoughts in the comments section. That being said though, until the next video, enjoy the rest of your day.